Hi, hello there. Welcome to IPv4 and IPv6 Addressing and Routing Review. This is Chapter 1 of the CCNP Enterprise Advanced Routing. So for Chapter 1, this covers the following content. So IPv4 Addressing, DHCP for IPv4, IPv6 Addressing, IPv6 LAT, Stateful DHCP v6, and Stateless DHCP version 6. Also included are packet forwarding process, routing information sources, static routes, and trouble tickets. So this chapter 1 is just a review of what you have learned from the previous CCNA. So let's get started. Now for IPv4 addressing, so just as your personal street address uniquely defines where you live, an IPv4 address uniquely defines where a device resides in a network. So basically, an IPv4 addressing is a logical address of the computer or devices into the network. So if devices are addressed incorrectly, they may not receive the packets that are intended for them. So it is imperative that you have a solid understanding of IPv4 addressing and how to verify that devices are addressed correctly on a network. So this section provides a review of IPv4 addressing and discusses issues you might face and how to troubleshoot them. Okay, so common troubleshooting issues is that, for instance, referring to this diagram here. Okay, so PC1 has an IP address of 10.1.1.10, okay, with subnet mask of 255.255.255.192. So that means this is slash 26, okay. So same thing with PC2, having an IP address of 10.1.1.20, okay? So same IP address or same default gateway, 255.255.255.192 or still slash 26. So we all know that these two computers belong to the same network, okay? So they belong to 10.1.1.0 slash 26, and their default gateway is the same, which is the router's interface Okay, so that is 10.1.1.1. Alright, so when a PC needs to communicate, for instance, PC1 needs to communicate with PC2. Okay, so it does a DNS lookup for the IP address of PC2. Okay, so the IP address 10.1.1.20 is returned. So now PC1 needs to determine whether PC2 is located on the same subnet because this determines whether the frame has the MAC address of PC2 or the MAC address of the default gateway or DG. Okay, so PC1 determines its network or subnet portion by comparing its IP address to its subnet mask in binary. So that is shown here. Okay, so this is the binary equivalent of the PC1's IP address, which is 10.1.1.10. Okay, and the subnet mask, which is 255.255.255.192. So we just have to perform an ending on these binary numbers. So something like 0 and 1 is 0, 0 and 1 is 0. Okay, any numbers ended with 0 is 0. And then 1 and 1 is, of course, 1. So applying the ending principle on these binary numbers, that would yield to 10 okay so this is 8 4 2 1 so that makes it 10 that 1 that 1 that 0 so that means these two pieces here pc1 and pc2 are on the same network all right so next would be pc1 will compare exactly the same binary bits to those binary bits in pc2 address so are as follows. So we'll take note that PC1 here is 10.1.1.10 and PC2 here is 10.1.1.20. Alright. So PC1 network, okay, or the subnet ID is given at 10.1.1.0. Okay. Now PC2 IP address in binary is 10.1.1.20. Okay, so this is 16, all right, 16, 8, 
4, 16 plus 4 is 20. So if you will observe here, okay, so the subnet ID of PC1, which is 10110, is the same as that of subnet ID of PC2, which is also a 10110. Okay, so because the binary bits are the same, so PC1 concludes that PC2 is in the same network or subnet. Right? So that's how it works. So therefore, it communicates directly with it and does not need to send the data to its default gateway. So PC1 creates a frame with its own source MAC address and the MAC address of PC2 as the destination. All right? So the first thing that the computer does is that it has to check whether the destination computer is on the same network. If it is not on the same network, then that's the time the PC or the source PC will forward it to the available default gateway. All right. Now, consider what occurs when PC1 needs to communicate with a web server. Now, going back to our topology here, okay. So the web server is located on 192.0.2.1. Okay. So um, this is basically located on the other network. Okay, 192.0.2.1 is different from 10.110.26 network. Okay, now assuming that the PC1 is to communicate with a web server at 192.0.2.1, so now PC needs to determine whether the web server is located on the same network or subnet. Okay, so just like PC1, what it does with PC2. Okay. So this determines whether the frame has the MAC address of the web server or the MAC address of the default gateway. So how is it so? So PC1 determines its network or subnet portion by comparing its IP address to its subnet mask in binary. So basically, we have here the binary equivalent of PC1 IP address. Okay. And the subnet mask of PC1 which is 255.255.255.192. Okay. So again, so applying ANDing principle, okay, so with the IP address and the subnet mask, that would yield to 10.1.1.0. So all of this will be zero. Okay. So PC1 network or subnet ID is 10.1.1.0. That is the slash 26. All right. So now PC1 compares the same binary to those binary bits in the web server address. Okay. So PC1 network or subnet ID is given at 10.1.1.0, right? Okay. And the web server IP address is at 192.0.2.1. All okay. So the web server is a different network or subnet because the bits are not the same. All right. So therefore, to communicate with a web server, it needs to send the data to its default gateway. So PC1 creates a frame with its own source MAC address and the MAC address of R1 as the destination. So going back to our topology here, okay. So after PC1 has known that the web server is not on the same network, so definitely PC1 will forward it to the default gateway. Okay. So the following happens if PC1 is configured with the wrong subnet mask. Okay. So 255.255.255.240. Okay. For instance. All right. So PC1 determines its network or subnet portion by comparing its IP address to its subnet mask in binary. So 240 is all ones for the first three octets and four octets on the fourth one or four, uh, four bits on the fourth octet. Okay. So this is equivalent to 240 here. Now comparing that or applying the ANDing principle. So this would yield to 10. Okay. That one, that one, that zero. This is slash 28. All right. So slash 28, this is 24 plus four. You've got slash 28. So now PC1 compares exactly the same binary bits to those binary bits in PC2 address. 
okay so slash 28 and the pc2 is 10.1.1.20 dot dot uh, here okay so this is the pc2 ip address in binary now after the comparison so pc1 concludes that pc2 is not on the same network or subnet because the binary bits are not the same so therefore it needs to send the frame to the router okay so that the router can route the packet to the subnet pc2 is in however the pcs are actually connected on the same subnet and as a result there is an ipv4 addressing and connectivity issues so beware of assigning or typing the subnet mask okay when you assign an ip address statically all right all right so determining an ip address within the subnet so how do you do this okay so how do you determine if all the ip address are in a particular subnet so in the subnet mask we have to find the most interesting octet so in binary it's the octet with the last binary one all right so in decimal it's the last octet that is greater than zero okay now in this example here in our topology okay so 1011.74, okay, 1011.20, and 10111. These are the IP addresses for PC1, PC2, and R1 LAN interface. Okay, so in this case, the 255.255.255.192, okay, so the fourth octet with a value greater than zero, and that value is 192, right? Now subtract 192 from 256. So that would yield to 64. The number 64 represents the block size of the number you are counting in okay, that octet. So the subnet in this case is 10110 slash 26 because the block size is 64. Okay, so remember what you have learned from your Cisco one, okay, IP addressing. Okay, so this subnet begins at 10110 slash 26 and ends at 1011.63 slash 26. So the next subnet would be 101164 slash 26 until 1011.127 slash 26. The third octet is 1011.128 slash 26 to 1011.191 slash 26 and so on. Okay, now suppose that PC1, PC2 and the interface of R1 here are to be in the same network or network block. Okay. Now in this case, PC1 falls on 1011.64 slash 26 to 1011.127 slash 26. Whereas PC2 here, okay, and the default gateway fall in the range of 1110 slash 26 to 1011.63 slash 26. So PC1, all right, is in a different network or subnet. So you must fix the address on PC1 so that it is within the correct network or subnet. Okay, so this is an incorrect assignment of an IP address for PC1. So beware of assigning or typing an IP address, especially if you're doing it on a static IP addressing or manual typing of IP addressing. All right, so to eliminate such problem, okay, of uh, typographical error or manually typing an IP address that leads to incorrect IP address. So we can use a DHCP for IPv4, okay? So dynamic host configuration protocol is commonly used for assigning an IPv4 address information to a network host, all right? So if you don't want the IP assignment done manually on the network, which in reality, we are using DHCP for that. Okay, so DHCP allows a DHCP client to obtain an IP address, subnet mask, default gateway, DNS server IP address, and other types of IP addressing information from the DHCP server. So this DHCP server could be a router or a computer that acts as a DHCP server. Okay. Now, reviewing the DHCP operations. So we have here a four step procedures okay now the figure here illustrates the exchange of messages discover offer 
request and acknowledgement or we call it the DORA process all right so discover offer request and acknowledgement okay so this occurs as the client obtains an IP address okay so from the server all right so step one is there would be an exchange of the HTTP discover okay and then the server will reply with a DHCP offer and then the client will be doing the request and then there would be an acknowledgement. So the DORA process is being performed okay, as the client is requesting an IP address from the server. Okay, so let's get into the details. So step number one is when a DHCP client initially boots, okay, it has no IP address. So when you just turn on your computer, there is no IP address yet no default gateway or other configuration information. So therefore, the way a DHCP client initially communicates is by sending the broadcast DHCP discover message to destination IP address 255.255.255.255 and destination MAC address all F, okay, attempting to discover a DHCP server. So the source IP is quad zero and the source MAC address is the MAC address of the sending device. All right. So basically in here, when the client issues or when the client were booted up, it automatically sends a broadcast DHCP discover to look for the DHCP server. All right. Second is, so when a DHCP server receives a DHCP discover message, it can respond with a DHCP offer message with an unlist IP addresses, subnet mask and default gateway information. So because the DHCP discover message is sent as a broadcast, more than one DHCP server might respond with the DHCP offer. So the client typically selects the server that sent the DHCP offer response it received. Okay. So this one now, the response is in unicast. But take note that the DHCP client might be getting several responses if you have multiple DHCP server. Right, so but then the client will consider the first server who responded to it. All right, so step number three is the HTTP request. Okay, so the DHCP client communicates with the selected server by sending a broadcasted DHCP request message indicating that it will be using the address provided in the DHCP offer, and as a result, wants the associated address list itself. All right, so recap, this is broadcast, unicast, broadcast, and the last one is an acknowledgement. So finally, the DHCP server responds to the client with DHCP acknowledgement message indicating that the IP address is list to the client and includes any additional DHCP options that might be needed at this point, such as the list duration. All right, next, how about the use of the HCP relay agent? So when do we use the HCP relay? Okay, so if it happens that your DHCP client is on different network than that of the DHCP server, then we will be using the DHCP relay. Now in this diagram here, okay, so take note that the DHCP client is on 172.16.1.0 24. And the server is at 10.1.1.0 slash 24. So in this case, okay, so the client, which is located on a different network, and the server also on different network, there is a need for us to use the DHCP relay agent. All right. So the DHCP discover message is sent as broadcast, but it cannot cross the router boundary. Okay. So take note that from our discussion earlier, okay. So the DHCP client will be sending a broadcast looking for the DHCP server. Okay. But since there is no DHCP server, okay, on the network, all right. So therefore the problem is it cannot pass through this router boundary here. So therefore, if a client resides on a different network from the DHCP server, you need to configure the default gateway of the client as the DHCP relay agent to forward the broadcast packets as unicast, 
okay, to the server. So we use here the IP helper address and then the address of the server. All right. So in here, the DHCP client belongs to 172.16.1.0 network, whereas the DHCP server belongs to 10.1.1.0/24 network. So we need to configure R1 as our DHCP relay agent. Okay. So how to configure it? So on R1, you do service DHCP. Okay. And then interface FA00, that is where the clients are connected. So if you are using, or if you are having multiple clients here and you are using a switch, all right? So that connection to the router, okay, should be where you configure the IP helper address, okay? And then the IP address of the server. So we do it as interface FA00, IP helper address 10.1.1.2. Okay, so in that case, if the DHCP client issues a DHCP discover, it will be forwarded in unicast by the router. Okay, so to the DHCP server. All right. So the service DHCP command enables the DHCP service on the router. So it is usually not required because the DHCP server is enabled by default. All right. So if in case you hit the um, no service DHCP, all right, so, and you need to enable it, then you have to use the service DHCP command. All right. So the IP helper address 10.1.1.2 command specifies the IP address of the DHCP server. So if the wrong IP address is specified, the DHCP messages are relayed to the wrong device. So in addition, the IP helper address command must be configured on the interface that is receiving the DHCP discover messages from the client. All right. So as DHCP relay agent, the router relays a few other broadcast types in addition to the DHCP message. So other protocols that are forwarded by the DHCP relay agent includes TFTP, DNS, ITS or the Internet Time Service, the NetBIOS, right? Name Server and Datagram Server, BootP and TACAX. Okay. Now let's take a look at the DHCP message type. So you've got DHCP Discover, okay? DHCP Offer, DHCP Request. You also have DHCP Decline, okay? So this message is sent from a client to the DHCP server to inform the server that an IP address is already in use on the network. Okay. You also have DHCP acknowledgement, which was used earlier on the discussion. You also have DHCP NAK, right? So the DHCP server sends this message to a client. It informs the client that the DHCP server declines to provide the client with the requested IP configuration information. You also have DHCP release. Okay, a client sends this message to the DHCP server and inform the DHCP server that the client has released its DHCP list, thus allowing the DHCP server to reassign the client IP address to another client. So we do this okay, on the client side by typing ipconfig space last release. All right. So we are releasing an IP address that we list from the server. And the next one is DHCP inform. This message is sent from the client to the DHCP server and requests IP configuration parameters. Such a message might be sent from an access server requesting IP configuration information for a remote client attaching to the access server. Okay, so how about if we will be configuring your router as a DHCP client? or a DHCP server. Now, if it is a client, well, we seldomly do this or we almost do not do this, all right? So we do not want our router to get an IP address dynamically from the source, okay? So mostly we are configuring router as a server, but if there is a need, okay, maybe for experimental purpose that you want your router to get an IP address from the DHCP server, then you have to do it in this fashion, all right? So on your router, configure terminal, 
interface FA01. So this is the interface that we want to get an IP address from the server. IP address, instead of typing the IP address manually, just type in their DHCP. In that sense, interface FA01 will become a DHCP client. All right. Next is, how about if we are going to configure the router as DHCP server? So we have to perform the following commands here. First, we need to identify the IP addresses that we need to exclude from the pool. Okay, so in this case, IP DHCP excluded address 10.8.8.1 and 10.8.8.10. Okay, so that is from 10.8.8.1 until 10.8.8.10. Right? So IP DHCP pool, the name of the pool is pool A. And then network 10.8.8.0 or slash 24. So default router is 10881 okay why do we have to exclude it because we might be using it as an ip address of the router or the servers on your network All right so dns server is at 192.168.1.1 so net bios name server is at 192.168.1.2 okay now you do not have to include the ip address of the router interface in the excluded address because the router never hands out its interface ip address all right okay so how about troubleshooting issues okay dhcp version 4 troubleshooting issues so consider the following potential issues okay so a router not forwarding broadcast okay so a router needs to be explicitly configured to act as DHCP relay agent if the DHCP client and DHCP server are on different networks. So do not forget to configure the DHCP relay. That's the solution to this. All right. Second is DHCP pull out of IP addresses. So once the pool becomes depleted, a new DHCP requests are rejected. So with this one, you have to ensure as network administrator that you have ample amount of IP addresses that is needed in the organization, right? So the next one is misconfiguration. This is a common issue, okay? So the configuration of a DHCP server might be incorrect, all right? Duplicate IP addresses, handing out an IP address to a client that is statically assigned to another host. So there would be an error of duplication of IP addresses if the IP addresses or the IP address that was statically assigned on any device in the network is also a part of the DHCP range that you have defined. All right. So again, based on our discussion earlier, if there is a need for you to assign an IP address statically, especially on the server, you have to exclude it from the range. All right. So the next one is redundant services not communicating. So DHCP servers can coexist with other DHCP servers for redundancy. So if inter-server communication fails, the DHCP servers hand out overlapping IP addresses to their clients. So you have to ensure that these multiple DHCP servers do perform the inter-server communication, right? So next one would be the pool nature of DHCP. So the DHCP server has no ability to initiate a change in the client's IP address after the client obtained an IP address. So the DHCP server cannot push information changes to the DHCP client. All right. So next would be interface not configured with IP address in DHCP pool. So a router or a multi-layer switch that is acting as a DHCP server must have an interface with an IP address that is part of the pool or subnet that is handling out IP addresses for. So this is not the case if a relay agent is forwarding the HTTP messages between the client and the router that is a DHCP server. All right. So if you have encountered any of these issues here, I hope you can solve it now. All right. So next is we have the DHCP troubleshooting commands. So basically on the router, you could have show IP DHCP conflict. Okay. 
Now, with this output here, if you have typed in that command, okay, so the output indicates a duplicate 172.16.1.3 address on the network, which the router discovered via ping. So you clear the information displayed by issuing clear DHCP or clear IP DHCP conflict asterisk. Okay, the space asterisk command after resolving the duplicate issue on the network. Okay, so another command is show IP DHCP binding. So this will show you, okay, or the output indicates that the IP address 10.1.1.10 was assigned to the DHCP client. Okay, and also with 10.1.1.3. So you can release the DHCP list with clear IP DHCP binding 10.1.1.10 or if you have clear IP DHCP binding space last or space asterisk, that would clear the DHCP binding. So if you want to clear only 10.1.1.10, then you have to specify the IP address. Okay. Next, you can also use the command debug IP DHCP server events. So it shows sample output from the debug IP DHCP server events command. Okay, so the output shows updates to the DHCP databases. All right. Okay, so next would be debug IP DHCP server packet. Now, this figure shows sample output from the debug DHCP server packet command. So the output shows DHCP release message being received when a DHCP client with IP address 10.1.1.3 is shut down so you'll have these notifications or logs from the server so you can also see the four-step process of a DHCP client obtaining an IP address 10114 okay with the following messages so DHCP discover DHCP offer DHCP request and DHCP acknowledgement right so that is all shown when you do the debug command Okay, specifically debug IP DHCP server packet. All right, so now that we're done with the IPv4 addressing, let's go ahead and do some recap on IPv6 addressing. Okay, so refer to the figure. This is the same figure, okay, or almost the same figure with that presented on IPv4. All right. So on this diagram, which depicts an IPv6 network, okay, so 2001 DB8AA64, okay, represents the first 64 bits in the IPv6 addresses. So which is the subnet prefix? So this is the IPv6 network the nodes reside in. So router one, all right, has interface IPv6 2001, all right. So DB8 AA colon colon one. So it's the GI00 here. Where the last 64 bits, okay, which are colon colon one in this case represent the interface host ID, okay, or who it is in the IPv6 network. Alright. So PC1 here is at colon colon 10. Okay, part of this network here. And PC2 is at colon colon 20. So all the devices in the 2001 colon DB8 colon A colon A colon colon slash 64 are configured with a default gateway address of the R1's G00 interface, which is 2001 colon DB8, all right, colon A colon A, then colon colon 1. Okay. Now, so in this example, Okay, so PC1 has the link local address of FEAT A00 colon 27FF colon FE5D colon 6D6 and the global unicast address of 2001 DB8 AA10. So which was statically configured. Now notice the percentage 11 at the end of the link local address. So this is the interface identification number and it is needed so that the system knows which interface to send the packets out of. Okay. Keep in mind that you can have multiple interfaces on the same device 
with the same link local address assigned to it. So that is something unique about IPv6. All right. Okay. So let's talk about the EUI64. So end devices can automatically assign their own IPv6 interface ID for the global unicast and link local addresses. So randomly or based on the IEEE EUI64 standard. Okay. Now the EUI64 takes the client's MAC address. Okay. So it takes the client's MAC address or the physical address. Okay. It splits it in half and adds the hex FFFE in the middle. All right. So in addition, it takes the seventh bit from the left and flips it. So if it is a one, then it becomes zero. And if it is zero, it becomes a one. Right. So on this diagram here, notice that the MAC address is 0800275D06. So split it in half and add FFFE in the middle to get 08. All right. So that is 08027FFFE5D05D6. Or simply 0800-27FF. Okay. You've got FE5D 06D6. Okay. So this is close to what is listed in the link local address, but it's not exactly the same. All right. So the interface ID in the link local address starts with 0A and ours starts at 08. All right. So this is because the seventh bit is flipped. Okay. So flip it. 08 hex in binary is 0000, 000 1000. This is 08 hex. So the seventh bit from the left to the right is 0. So make it a 1. Okay. So now you have 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. So convert it to hexadecimal. So you get 08. So your interface ID is 08, 00, uh, 27FF. FE5D06D6. All right. So modern Windows PCs randomly generate the interface portion by default for both the link local address and the global unicast address when auto configuring their IPv6 addresses. So, however, this can be changed so that the EUI64 is used instead. Okay. So on a router, if you want to use the EUI64 for a statically configured global unicast address, so you use the EUI64 keyword. All right. So that's in this example here. So verify the global unicast address and the EUI64 interface ID assigned to an interface by using the show IPv6 interface command. All right. So you can verify using this command here. All right, so how about the IPv6 slack, stateful DHCPv6, and stateless DHCPv6? Okay, so manually assigning an IP addresses, either IPv4 or IPv6, is not scalable option. So that is why we are using the dynamic host configuration protocol for IPv4 and IPv6. So in IPv6, okay, so you've got stateful DHCPv6 and stateless DHCPv6 and of course the IPv6 lab. Okay, so this section looks at the issues that might arise for each and how to troubleshoot them. All right, so let's start with the Slack. Okay, so Slack is designed to enable a device to configure its own IPv6 address prefix and default gateway without the HTTP basic server. So Windows PCs automatically have Slack enabled and generate their own IPv6 addresses. All right, so you could go ahead on your operating systems if it is Windows and you explore it. Okay, 
So on Cisco routers, if you want to take advantage of this app, you need to enable it manually on an interface with the command IPv6 address autoconfig command. So something like, for instance, I want to enable it on Giga Ethernet 00 or G00. Just type in there IPv6 address autoconfig. This is how to enable Slap on the specific router interface. Okay, so when a PC and router interface are enabled for Slap, they send an RS or router solicitation message to determine whether there are any routers connected to a local link. Okay, so they wait for the router to send a router advertisement that identifies the prefix being used by the router. So the default gateway connected to the same network. Okay, so they use the prefix information to generate their own IPv6 address in the same network as the router interface that generated the array. So the router uses the EUI64 for the interface ID and the PC randomly generates the interface ID unless it is configured to use EUI64. So in addition, the PC uses the IPv6 link local address of that device that sent data, okay, or that sent the RA as the default gateway address. Okay, now in here, in this figure, RA or R1, okay, sends an RA or router advertisement. So R1 sends router advertisements to these devices here. Now the source IP address is the G00 link local address, right? So which is this interface here with colon colon one. And the source MAC address is the MAC address of G00. So the destination IP address is all the, or is the all nodes link local multicast IPv6 address FF02 colon colon one. All right. So the destination MAC address is all the nodes, destination MAC address 33, 33, okay, 00, 00, 00, 00, 00, 00, 01. So by default, all the IPv6 enabled interface listen for packets and frames distant for those two addresses. All right. Now to verify an IPv6 address generated by Slack, so on the router interface, you can use the command show IPv6 interface command. Okay. So in this example, show IPv6 interface G00. So the global unicast address was generated using Slack. All right. So also notice at the bottom of the example that the default router is listed as link local. Okay. So link local address of R1. So however, Note that this occurs only if IPv6 unicast routing was not enabled on router R1. And as a result, the router is acting as an end device. All right. Next, how about router advertisements? So RAs are generated by default on a router. Okay. Only if the router interface is enabled for IPv6. So IPv6 unicast routing is enabled and RA are not being suppressed on the interface. So therefore, if a Slack is not working, you need to check the following. Okay, so IPv6 unicast routing is configured. The appropriate interface is enabled for IPv6 by using the show IPv6 interface command. Okay, next, the router interface advertising RAs has a slash 64 prefix. So Slack works only if the router is using a slash 64 prefix. Okay? And then that RAs are not being suppressed on the interface as shown here. All right? Okay. So how about the stateful DHCP v6? So with Slack, a device can determine if it's IPv6 address, prefix, and default gateway, but not much else. Okay. So in modern networks, devices may need additional information such as NTP server, domain name, 
DNS server, and TFTP server. So to hand out the IPv6 addressing information along with all the optional information, use the stateful DHCPv6 server. So both Cisco routers and multi-layer switches may act as the HTTP server. All right. So example 1-21 here provides a sample DHCPv6 configuration on R1. And the IPv6 DHCP server interface command necessary to enable the interface to use the DHCP pool for handling out IPv6 addressing information. So although it is not pictured, okay, in this example 1-21, the IPv6 and the Manage Config Flag Interface Configuration command on interface G00 ensures that the RA from router R1 informs the client to contact the DHCPv6 server. This is for all the IPv6 network addressing, prefix length, and other information. Okay? So, stateless IPv6 or the stateless DHCPv6 is a combination of Slack and DHCPv6. Okay? So the router advertisements is used by the clients to automatically determine the IPv6 address. So prefix and default gateway. Also included in the RA is a flag that tells the client to get other non-addressing information from the DHCPv6 server, such as the address of the DNS server or ETFTP server. So to accomplish this, ensure that the IPv6 and the other config flag interface configuration command is enabled. So this ensures that the RA informs the client that it must contact the DHCPv6 server for other information. Now in the diagram here, the output of the show IPv6 interface Gigabit Ethernet 00 states that the host obtaining an IPv6 addressing from stateless autoconfig okay and other information from the DHCP server all right so it's in here hosts use stateless autoconfig for addresses so hosts use DHCP to obtain other configuration all right so you just have to use the command show IPv6 interface gigabit Ethernet 00. All right, so how about the DHCP v6 operations? Okay, we have that Dora in IPv4. Okay, in DHCP v6, it has four step negotiation process, just like an IPv4. So, however, DHCP v6 uses the following messages. So, it doesn't follow the Dora principle of IPv4. All right, so for IPv6 or DHCP v6, you've got solicit, advertise, request, and reply. All right, so solicit, a client sends this message to locate the DHCP server or the DHCP v6 servers using the multicast address FF02 colon colon 1 colon 2, which is the all DHCP v6 servers multicast address. So after that, advertise. So servers responds to solicit message with a unicast advertise message. So offering addressing information to the client and third is request so the client sends this message to the server confirming the addresses provided and any other parameters and the last one is reply so the server finalizes the process with this message okay now this table here so summarizes the DHCP message type Okay, so it provides a comprehensive list of DHCP v6 message types you might encounter while troubleshooting DHCP v6 issues. So we also have a list similar to this in IPv4. Alright, next, if in IPv4, you also have the relay. Okay, so if in case the client or the DHCP client is not on the same network as that of the DHCP server, then we also have the DHCP v6 relay agent. Okay, so if you review the multicast address of the solicit message, notice that it is a link local scope multicast address. So it starts with FF02. So therefore, 
the multicast does not leave the local network and the client is not able to reach the DHCP v6 server okay now to relay the DHCP v6 messages to the DHCP v6 server in another network the local router interface in the network the client belongs to needs to be configured as relay agent with ipv6 dhcp relay destination interface configuration command okay now this diagram here shows the interface giga ethernet 00, zero configured with the command ipv6 dhcp relay destination and then the ip address 2001 db8 ab colon colon seven okay so which is used to forward solicit messages to the dhcp server v6 at the address listed all right so let's talk about packet forwarding process so this section discusses the packet forwarding process and the commands used to verify the entries in the data structures that are used for this process so it also provides you with a collection of cisco ios software commands that are useful when troubleshooting related issues okay so let's have some recap of the layer 3 packet forwarding process okay so if you are experiencing connectivity issues between two hosts on a network you could check the layer 3 by pinging between hosts though that's what you usually does right so the first thing that we do is to ping okay so the pc Okay, so from one PC to another. If the pings are successful, the issues resides at the upper layers of the OSI reference model. Okay, so that's layer 4 through layer 7. So if the pings fail, you should troubleshoot layers 1 to 3. Okay, so if you determine the problem is at layer 3, you might look at the packet forwarding process of a router. So review the layer 3 packet forwarding process consider figure 1 does 10 here now in this topology pc1 needs to access the http server okay resources on this server one here okay so notice that pc1 and server 1 are on different networks because logically okay so based on the diagram so it was separated by multiple routers so definitely they are on different networks right now how do we do the troubleshooting so pc1 concludes that the destination ip address resides on a remote subnet okay so based on the demonstration or based on the discussions that we had earlier okay so how these computers or how computers will check if the destination device is on the same network or on the other network okay so in this case pc1 needs to send a frame to its default gateway okay because it is on the other network so pc1 has a default gateway address of 192.168.1.1 which is router one okay so to construct a layer two frame pc1 needs the mac address of the frames destination so which is the pc1's default gateway okay so if the mac address is not in pc1's address resolution protocol or arp cache pc1 uses the arp to discover it so once pc1 receives an arp reply from the router r1 pc1 adds router r1's mac address to its arp cache so pc1 then sends its data distant for server one in a frame address to r1 as shown here on our diagram now, if you will observe in this diagram here, so we are just on PC1 going to the default gateway. So if you look at it, okay, so the PC1's ARP cache consists of 192.168.1.1, which is the default gateway, okay, of PC1, which happens to be the R1's FA00 here, okay. And of course, the corresponding MAC address, which is the MAC address of FA00, r1 interface okay so this is how it looked like for our data okay or the, the pdu okay so in here the source ip address is basically the pc1 which is 192.168.1.2 and the destination ip address is of course 
the server one, which is at 192.168.3.2. Okay, now take a look at the source and destination MAC address here. Okay, so PC1 is the source that is MAC address all ones here. All right, and the destination's MAC address should be the MAC address of the R1's FA00 interface, which happens to be the default gateway of PC1. All right. Okay, so let's take the next step here. Okay, so R1 receives the frame sent from PC1. And because the destination MAC address is R1's, so R1 tears off the layer 2 header and interrogates the layer 3 header. Okay, so R1 decrements the packet's TTL field. If the value of the TTL field is reduced to zero, the router discards the packet and sends a time exceeded ICMP message back to the source. So assuming that the TTL is not decremented to zero, so R1 checks its routing table to determine the best path to reach the IP address 192.168.3.2. Okay. So R1's routing table has an entry starting that network 192.168.3.0 is last 24. That is accessible through interface serial 0 or serial 11. Okay. So ARP is not uh, required for serial interfaces because they do not have MAC address. All right. So therefore, R1 forwards the frame out its serial 11 interface using the point-to-point -point protocol or PPP. Okay. So in this case, we are now between R1 and R2. So again, the data is still HTTP. Okay. So transport TCP. The source IP address here is 192.168.1.2. Okay, so still that's on PC1 and the destination would be still your server. All right. Now, step number three, that would now be from R2 going to the server. So when the router 2 receives the frame, it removes the PPP header and then decrements the TTL again in the IP header. So just as router R1 did. Okay. So again, assuming that the TTL did not get decremented to zero so router r2 interrogates the ip header to determine the destination network so in this case the destination network 192.168.3.0 okay is directly attached to the routers r2's fast ethernet 00 okay so r2 sends the arp request to determine the mac address of server one if it is not already known in the arp cache Okay, so once an ARP reply is received from server 1, router 2 stores the result of the ARP reply in the ARP cache and forwards the frame out its FA00 interface to server 1 as shown here. Okay, so again, from R2 going to the server 1, so your source IP is still PC1, destination IP is still the server, but take a look at the source and destination MAC address. So the source MAC address is the R2's FA00 MAC address and the destination MAC address is that of server 1 okay, MAC address, which is 2222222222. All right, so how about the IP routing table? Okay. So when a router needs to route an IP packet, it consults its IP routing table to find the best match. So the best match is the route that has the longest prefix. For example, suppose a router has a routing entry for networks 10.0.0.0 slash 8, 10.1.1.0 slash 24, and 10.1.1.1 slash 0 slash 26. Also suppose that the router is trying to forward a packet with destination IP address 10.1.1.10. Okay, so the router selects the 10.1.1.0 slash 26 route entry as the best match because that route entry has the longest match, which is slash 26. Okay, so it matches the most bits. Again, this is a recap from your Cisco one. Okay, so layer 2 or layer 3 to layer 2 mapping table. So in figure 1.13 here, the basic routing step 3, okay, 
Arctos ARP cache contains a layer 3 to layer 2 mapping information. So the ARP cache has a mapping that says MAC address 2222-2222-2222 corresponds to an IP address 192.168.3.2. Alright, so an ARP cache is the layer 3 to layer 2 mapping data structure used for the Ethernet networks. But similar data structures are used for multi-point frame relay networks and dynamic multi-point virtual private network or DMVPN. So for PPP or HDLC network, there is only one other possible device connected to the other end of the link. So no mapping information is needed to determine the next hub device. All right. Okay, so querying the router's routing table and its ARP cache is less than efficient. Okay, so fortunately, the Cisco Express Forwarding or CEPH cleans its information from the router's IP routing table and the ARP cache. Then CEPH's data structures in hardware can be referenced with forwarding packets. Okay, so the two primary CEPH data structures are as follows. So you've got the FIB. Okay, or the forwarding information base and the adjacency table. Okay, so the FIB contains layer 3 information similar to the information found in the IP routing table. So in addition, an FIB contains information about multicast routes and directly connected hosts. So adjacency table, when a router performs a route lookup using Ceph, the FIB references an entry in the adjacency table. The adjacency table entry contains frame header information required by the router to properly form a frame. So an egress interface and the next hub MAC address is an adjacency entry for multi-point Ethernet interface, whereas a point-to-point -point Ethernet or interface requires only egress interface information. Okay. Now, how do we troubleshoot the packet forwarding process? So, when troubleshooting packet forwarding issues, you need to examine a router's IP routing table. Usually, we show show IP route, right? So, if the observed behavior of the traffic is not conforming to information in the IP routing table, remember that the IP routing table is maintained by a router's control plane and is used to build the tables at the data plane. So Ceph is operating in the data plane and uses the FIB. So you need to view the Ceph data structure, that is FIB and adjacency table that contain all the information required. So to make packet forwarding decisions. So the figure here provides a sample output of the show IP route IP address command. So usually we just use the show IP route, but then if you want to be more specific, so you just have to include the IP address here. Okay, so the output shows the next up IP address to reach IP address 192.168.1.11 and that is 192.168.0.11 which is accessible via interface fast Ethernet 00. So because this information is coming from the control plane, so it includes information about the routing protocol OSPF. All right, so um, example 1-28 here provides a sample output from show IP Ceph IP address command. So the output indicates that according to Ceph, IP address 192.168.1.11 is accessible out interface FA00, okay? With the next up IP address at 192.168.0.11, All right? So the following snippets provide sample output from the show IP Ceph exact route source address destination address command okay so you're gonna have the show ipsf exact route 10.2.2.2.1.9.2.168.1.11 so the output indicates that a packet sourced from ip address 10.2.2.2 and distinct for ip address 192.168.1.11 will be sent out interface fast ethernet 00 the next up ip address 192.168.0.11 Alright, 
Now for multi-point interface such as point-to-multi-point frame relay or Ethernet, when a router knows the next hub address for a packet, it needs appropriate layer 2 information. For example, so next hub packet address or the data link connection identifier or DLC to properly construct a frame. Okay, now the diagram here, the figure here, provides a sample output from the show IP ARP command which displays the ARP cache that is stored in the control plane of a router. Okay, so the output shows the learned or configured MAC address along with the uh, associated IP addresses. All right. Okay, another diagram here provides a sample output from the show adjacency detail command. So the output shows the Ceph information used to construct frame headers needed to reach the next hub IP addresses through the various router interfaces. So notice the value of 645.10800, okay, for serial 10. Okay, so this is the hexadecimal representation of information that is needed by the router to successfully forward the packet to the next hub IP address. 17216 okay 33.5 okay including the del c405 so notice the value okay so which is this hexadecimal values here okay for fast ethernet 30 okay so this is the destination mac address so the source mac address and the ether type code for an ethernet frame so the first 12 hex values are the destination MAC address. And the next 12 are for the source MAC address. And the 0800 here is the IPB for Ether type code. Okay, so let's talk about the routing information sources. So this section explains which sources of routing information are the most believable and how the routing table interacts with the various data structures to populate itself with the best information. Still remember the term believable. So what comes into your mind when you have heard of this? So that is the administrative distance, right? So that is the level of believability. Let's go ahead and go for this routing information sources. All right, so um, as the router receives routing information from the neighboring router, the information is stored in the data structures of the IP routing protocol and analyzed by the routing protocol to determine the best path based on metrics. Okay, so um, an IP routing protocol's data structure can also be populated by the local router. For example, a router might be configured for route redistribution where routing information is redistributed from the routing table into the IP routing protocol's data structure. So specific interfaces can also participate in the IP routing protocol, okay? And the network that interface belongs to is placed into the routing protocol data structure as well. Now the diagram here shows the routing protocol data structure, which can populate the routing table a directly connected route and the static routes can populate the routing table. So these are all known as sources of routing information. All right. So you can see it via the show IP route command. Okay. So show IP route will just display the routing table, but you can see there the administrative distance. All right. Or the level of believability. Okay. So routing information sources are each assigned an administrative distance or AD. So administrative distance is the believability or the level of trustworthiness a routing source when comparing it with the other routing information sources. Okay. Now the table here summarizes the different administrative distance okay, of the different routing protocols used in the network. So routes are injected into the routing table only if the router concludes that they came from the best routing source. So if you ever need to make sure that the routing information or subset of routing information received 
from a particular source is never used change the AD of specific routes for all routes from the source to 255 okay so that means not believable or unknown okay so another option is to create a floating static route which is a backup route configured to have a higher AD and therefore be less preferred so that is then the route that is preferred all right so if you'll observe on this table so from your previous Cisco also or CCNA courses so we dealt about this one okay we're in the directly connected network or connected interface has an administrative distance of zero okay and as the number increases the number or the level of trustworthiness or believability decreases Okay, so let's talk about static routes now. So this section discusses the syntax of IPv4 and IPv6 static routes and explains what to look for while troubleshooting. Okay? Okay, so let's start the static routes with IPv4 basic configuration. So static routes are basically manually configured by administrators. So they are the second most trustworthy source of routing information with course an administrative distance of one next to directly connected networks which is zero so they allow an administrator to precisely control how to route packets for a particular destination so the following is a configuration of static routes on r1 okay so the static route tells r1 how to reach 10.1.3.0 having the subnet mask of 255.255.255.0 and that is via the next hub IP address 10.1.12.2, which is R2, and is assigned an administrative distance of 8. Okay, so the default is 1. Alright, so when troubleshooting an IPv4 static routes, you need to be able to recognize why the static route may not be providing the results you want. Okay, so maybe common mistakes would be, are the network and the mask accurate so if either of them is incorrect your static route will not route the packets you are expecting it to route so the router might drop the packets because it does not match the static route or any other route so it might end up forwarding packets using the default route which may be pointing the wrong way so in addition if the static route includes networks that is or that should not, you could be routing packets the wrong way. All right. So if you are to configure the static route, IP route 10130 255.255.255.0. Okay. And then that is a 10.1.12.1 on R2. Okay. Packets distinct to 10.1.3.0 would be sent to R1, which is the wrong way. However, Notice an example here, okay, or example 1.35, that R1 points to R2 or 10.1.12.2 for networks 10.1.3.0.24. So therefore, R1 and R2 simply bounce packets that are distance for 10.1.3.0 back and forth until the TTL expires. So we all know when the TTL expires, that would be unreachable. Okay, the default value of the TTL is 2.55. So for every half, minus one on the value of the TTL. Okay. So notice that the next up address is a very important parameter for the static route. So it tells the local router where to send the packet. Okay. So for instance, in example one, that's 35 here. The next hub is 10.1.12.2. All right. So therefore, a packet distinct to 10130 has to go to 101122 next. R1 now does a recursive lookup in the routing table for 101122 to determine how to reach it. Okay? So when you say recursive lookup, it has to refer to the routing table twice. If you are going to evaluate this, so S10130 is reachable via 101122. Now the router has to look for the network where this 10.1.12.2 belongs to 
before forwarding it to the interface. Okay, that's recursive lookup. Now, in this case, the routing entry for 10.1.12.0, which is the network for 10.1.12.2, that is directly connected via Giga Ethernet 1.0. So see, the router has reference to the routing table twice. That's why we called it recursive lookup. That's the disadvantage of using the next up IP address. Okay, so a better option to this is to use the exit interface. All right, so we're in the router doesn't have to perform a recursive lookup. Okay, so this is what I'm saying. The use of the exit interface eliminates the possibility of recursive lookup. Okay, so in this example, imagine that users in 10.1.1.0 slash 24 network are trying to access resources on 10.1.3.1 through 10.1.3.8. So R1 receives the packets and it looks in the routing table and finds that the longest match is the following entry. Okay, so something like static 10.1.3.0 is directly connected and the exit interface. Okay, so that means 10.1.3.0 is reachable via Giga Ethernet 1.0 here. All right. Next, how about the proxy ARP? So example 1.39 here shows the ARP cache on R1. So notice that every destination IP address has an entry in the ARP cache. How can that be if ARP requests are not forwarded by routers? All right. So if it is because of proxy ARP, which is on by default on the routers, the proxy ARP allows a router to respond to ARP requests with its own MAC address if it has a full route in the routing table to the IP addresses or IP address in the ARP requests. So notice that the MAC address or MAC addresses listed are all the same. In addition, they match the MAC address of the 10.1.12.2 entry. Therefore, because R2 has a route to reach the IP address of the ARP request, it responds back with its MAC address. Right. Now, next would be example one does 40 here shows how to use the show IP interface command to verify whether the proxy ARP is enabled. So you can see that below. Okay. When you type in the show interface, Giga Ethernet 00 here, proxy ARP is enabled. All right. So if a proxy ARP is not enabled, the ARP cache on R1 appears as shown in example one does 41 here. Okay, so notice that R1 is still sending ARP requests. However, it is not getting any ARP replies. Therefore, it cannot build the layer 2 frame and the result is encapsulation failure. So you have to ensure that the proxy ARP is enabled here. Okay, so because of the fact that R1 uses ARP to determine the MAC address of every destination IP address in every packet, you should never specify an Ethernet interface in a static route. Okay, so specifying an Ethernet interface in a static route results in excessive use of router resources, such as processor and memory, as the control plane gets involved during the forwarding process to determine the appropriate layer 2 MAC address using ARP. Well, if you are just using a three router topology, so you might not experience that, or you might not experience having it uh, consumes a lot of resources. But if you are on the production enterprise network, okay, so you're gonna feel that that your network slows down because of the excessive use of the resources. All right, so let's talk about the IPv6 static routes. So the following displays the configuration of an IPv6 static route on R1. Okay, so the static route tells R1 about 2001 GB8 0 3 slash 24 network. So the network is reachable using the next hub address, FEAT, colon, colon, two, which is the R2's link local address. And it was assigned an administrative distance of eight. So take note, the default is one. So notice that the Ethernet interface is specified here, the Giga Ethernet one zero. So this is mandatory when using the link local address as the next hub 
because the same link local address can be used on multiple local router interfaces. So in addition, multiple remote router interfaces can have the same link local address as well. So as long as the link local addresses are unique between the devices within the same local network, communication occurs as intended. So if you are using the global unicast address as the next hub, you do not have to specify the exit interface. All right. So there are no broadcasts within IPv6. So therefore, IPv6 does not use ARP. All right. So it uses the NDP or the Neighbor Discovery Protocol, which is a multicast based to determine the neighboring device MAC address. So in this case, if R1 needs to route packets to 2001, right? So DB8, 0, 3, slash 24, slash 64, the routing table says to use the next hub address FEAT, colon, colon 2, which is out G10. So therefore, it consults its IPv6 neighbor table as shown in the following snippets to determine whether there is a MAC address for FEAT colon colon 2 out G10. Right? So if there is no entry in the IPv6 neighbor table, a neighbor solicitation message is sent to discover the MAC address FEAT colon colon 2 on G10. All right? Okay, so um, proxy ARP does not exist in IPv6. So therefore, in an IPv6 static route, if you only use the interface option with an Ethernet interface, it works only if the destination IPv6 address is directly attached to the router interface specified. All right, so this is because the destination IPv6 address in the packet is used as the next hub address. And the MAC address needs to be discovered using NDP. Okay, so if the destination is not in the directly connected network, neighbor discovery fails and the layer to encapsulation ultimately fails. Okay, so when you have IPv6 route 2001 DB8 colon 0 colon 3 colon colon slash 64 gigabit Ethernet 10. So when R1 receives a packet distance for 2001 DB8 Zero three uh, colon colon slash sixty four. It determines based on the static route that is directly connected to gig one zero, which is not according to figure one does eighteen. All right. So therefore, R one sends a neighbor solicitation or NS out G one zero for the MAC address associated with two thousand one DB eight zero three colon colon slash 64 so using the solicited node okay multicast address ff02 colon 1 ff00 colon 3 if no device attached to g10 is using the solicited node multicast address ff02 colon 1 ff00 colon 3 and the ipv6 address 2001 db8033 the ns goes unanswered and layer to encapsulation fails. Okay. So next would be trouble tickets. So this section presents various trouble tickets related to topics discussed earlier. So the purpose of this section is to show you a process you can follow when troubleshooting the real world or in an exam environment. All right, so let's have this trouble ticket one. So what's the problem? PC1 is not able to access resources on the web server 192.0.2.1. Okay, so this is your PC1. And it's not able to access the resources on the server or web server at 192.0.2.1. Okay, so what we're going to do is, of course, we have to ping. Okay, so a ping from PC1 going to the web server fails okay when you tested it it fails and then you try to ping from pc1 to 192 or pc1 to the default gateway okay so which is r1 at 10111 okay so when you ping it it succeeds right so the next one would be a ping from pc2 
to 192.0.2.1 succeeds. Okay, so layer 2 entry connectivity from PC1 and PC2 to the router is fine. You have confirmed that PC2 can reach the internet resources. So it's just that PC1 is not able to access resources on the web server. But based on the test, okay, so PC1 can access the default gateway. Okay, so possible reason. Okay, so an access control list or ACL is denying PC1 from accessing the resources on the inter internet. Yes, it is possible. Okay, or and that issue could be preventing 10.1.1.10 from being translated if you are using NAT, yeah. Okay, or PC1 could be sending packets distant to a remote network to a wrong default gateway. Okay, so what's the solution to this? You see that the default gateway is configured as 10.1.1.100, okay? So when you see this, the default gateway is 10.1.1.100 and the default gateway here is 10.1.1.1. Okay? So that means you have an incorrect default gateway. Okay? So that's how we do the troubleshooting. Okay? So you can ping the default gateway. Yes. Why? Because they are on the same network. Okay? But Take note, your default gateway here specified on the PC is 10.1.1.100. Okay, so which is not on any of the interface active here. All right, so we need to correct this. Okay, so that's troubleshooting ticket number one. Now, troubleshooting ticket number two. So the problem is PC1 is not able to access resources in the web server 192. 021. Okay. So all right. So uh, upon testing a ping from PC1 to this 192.162.0 fails. So when you ping the web server fails. All right. Now a ping from the PC1 to the default gateway at 10111 fails. So this one also fails all right so it seems that pc1 is isolated now a ping from pc2 or a ping from pc2 to 192.0.2.1 also fails so this one also fails here all right this is also a failure and a ping from pc2 to the default gateway also fails so that means no traffic traverses r1 Okay, so no layer 2 and layer 3 connectivity from PC1 and PC2 to the router. Okay, so possible reasons. Well, VLANs, VLAN ACLs, trunks, VTP and STP are all possible. Okay, or start with a simple solution and check IP addressing on PC1. Okay, now on R1, you type in show run interface 00. Okay, and IP helper address 172.16.1.100. Okay, so take note that on the diagram, the DHCP server is on 1.10. So that means this PC1 and PC2 here, okay, is not capable of getting an IP address if it is configured with DHCP. Okay, so you see that PC1 has a PIP addressing and no default gateway. Okay, so if you will observe here, okay, so it has an PIP addressing and no default gateway, it cannot reach the default or the DHCP server. So the DHCP server is on another network, all right, so from the diagram here, which means the router needs to be configured to forward the DHCP discover broadcast. Okay. So the output indicates that IP helper address 172.16.1.100 is not correct because it should be that then. Right? It should be that then here. Okay? So that's our trouble ticket two. Now trouble ticket number three. 
So PC1 is not able to access resources on the web server. Okay, so this is an IPv6 now. So a ping from PC1 to the web server fails. Okay, a ping from PC1 to the default gateway also fails. Okay, so that is at G00-2001 DP8AA colon colon 1. Now, an IP config reveals PC1 is not generating an automatic addressing. Okay, an IPv6 or an IP config reveals that PC2 is not also generating an automatic addressing. So possible reasons. Are the PCs configured for automatic addressing? You have to check it out. Or is R1 configured to provide an RACE to the PCs for Slack to work? Okay. So your issue or you issue the command show IPv6 interface on R1. So the output indicates that the host use Slack addresses. Okay. Okay, so, and DHCP is used for another configuration values. However, it also indicates that RA are suppressed. Right? So, you issue show run interface G00 to verify the configuration on the interface. So, and then the interface is configured with IPv6 and DRA suppress all which stops R1 from sending arrays. All right. Next, trouble ticket number four. So the problem is users in the 10110 network are not able to access the FTP server. This is your destination. Okay. The users would be coming from the 10110. So this is your source. Okay. They are not able to access the FTP server at 10.1.3.10, nor the web server at 10.1.3.5. So FTP cannot be accessed and also your www server. Alright. Now a ping from PC1 to 10.1.3.10 fails. Who's 10.1.3.10? 10 okay so um, that is the ftp server this is 10 1 3 10 okay and r1 responds with a destination unreachable message indicating that there is no or there is not route all right so a ping from 10 1 3 5 to 10 1 3 10 is successful so possible reasons, does R1 have a route to 10130? You have to check that out. Or do routers R2 and R3 have routes to these networks? Okay. So you issue the show IP route command on R1 and verify whether it knows how to route the packet to 101310. Okay. So the closest match in the routing table is a static route 10130 slash 29. So you're going to have it here. Right, so which means the 101310 is not covered by the range of addresses in the 10130 slash 29 subnet. So you remove, okay, you remove and replace the static route, and pings are now successful. All right, all right, so that's the end of this video lecture. See you on the next chapter. Have a great day.